Hello, everybody. It is great to be here one more time today. And my name is Gary Fowler. I'm the CEO, president, and co-founder of GSD Get You Done Venture Studios. I'm a serial entrepreneur and investor. I've been involved in 17 startups and two unicorns. I was on the original management team at Click Software, which was sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion, and also EVA.ai. We believe that intellectual capacity is evenly spread around the world, but opportunities are not. So with that, I have an incredible guest today, and we're going to talk about how we're going to make this world a better place. I'd like to introduce uh, Sanjay. Sanjay is a serial entrepreneur, an inventor, an investor, and a pioneer in analytics and data science. He worked in places like Radiant Systems and Microsoft as a teenager, and he did a little bit of time at Trilogy. He founded Izenda, a market leader embedded in the business intelligence uh, used by 3M people uh, in his dorm room during his MBA. So he's one of those kind of guys. But by the way, he finished his MBA, went to Georgia Tech. After growing his end to a multi-million dollar run rate, he raised a Series A and formed a board and management team. He then started investing and advising in, to data-driven companies, and that's where he is today. He's an inventor. He's an investor. He's an artist. And oh, yeah, he's like a yogi master. So with that, I'd like to bring Sanjay in. <laughs> Hi, Happy Sanjay. Thursday. How is everyone? Yeah, it's great to see you today. So tell me a little bit about it. How in the world? So you you went to Georgia, right? So when you were going to um, Georgia Institute of Technology, so you decided what what made you to go there to begin with? Are you from Georgia originally or where are you from? Yeah, from Georgia. So I was born in India, came to New York as a kid, but then spent most of my life in Atlanta and um, was at Georgia Tech and uh, did some different contract work and internships. I worked for Microsoft for a bit and, uh, you know, and then sort of just started traveling the world. And then I went to grad school and then started, um, you know, started my first company, Izenda, just seeing an opportunity and, you know, bringing, you know, what, what I could do as a data scientist, but bring that to everyday people. So, so you did that, you know, you, you did a Zenda in your, your, um, in your dorm room, you know, you got your MBA. Why'd you go to Georgia to begin with? Anyhow, is it like you just wanted to go in the warm weather or what did you wake up one day and say, Oh, I want to go down. There. I like pecans. I'm going to Georgia. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that was, that was, no, it was my parents' decision actually. So they were, we were in New York area and they just saw a lot of opportunity in Atlanta as the, at the time the Olympics were, were uh, arriving there. So we moved for the, uh, the Olympics and all the opportunities um, around that. And then uh, just sort of uh, just got it, you know, kind of got a full ride to Georgia Tech. So took it. Well, you can't beat that. Full yeah. rides are a good thing. They are. All right. So, and then you went for your MBA. What made you decide to go for your MBA there? You know, I just uh, started, uh, you know, at the time it was like actually after September 11th of sort of figuring out what to do next after kind of the e-commerce boom had ended. Um, and they had uh, some great programs for study abroad. So I, I traveled to you know, Japan, Australia, London, just um, really at the time, I just wanted to travel. So I went to grad school for that. And uh, it turned out that some of this business stuff was useful. And uh, when I saw the opportunity, it kind of kind of formed a business. So what's going on with Zenda? Is it business today or what's happening with it? Uh, yeah, Zenda is now part of Alagi Analytics, so there's still millions of people out there using it, but it's part of uh, Inside Software acquired it last year. Well, that's great. That's got to feel good. Yeah, it does. Oh, super. So, and then tell us about you. So, Pulse Wave. What is Pulse Wave? Yeah, so Pulse Wave is sort of a um, kind of an R and D incubator that I've used to sort of create new um, IP and innovations, and then spin them out into. Uh, other partnerships or companies. So um, the last project, we actually worked with Rihanna on her Fenty brand to launch physical stores. And we created some AI that uses the LiDAR sensor on an iPhone Pro to essentially create a torso of a person's avatar without any photography in a very private way um, that allows the store associates to sort of measure people very accurately and then use AI to do prediction on apparel sizing. And so we, we created that and then um, kind of merged that into FitMatch, released it under Fenty. And now we're working a, a new one called, uh, called Run Day, which I'm very excited about. It's using, uh, you know, transformational AI to be a, a personal assistant, just like Jane, that, uh, that's available to everyone in the world 24-7. And um, the idea is if I want to, you know, meet with you and five other people, I just send one email 
uh, CC the bot. And, um, you know, it does all the the magic of creating a Zoom meeting, figuring out when everyone's available and uh, books it in everyone's calendar. Well, I think. Now, so tell us about that. Why? You know, because, you know, we got this infobesis, Sanjay, around us, right? There's so many things we need to do all the time and it's really hard to take care of it. So where, is, you know, what one day is going to evolve? Where do you see that? See it over the next two to three years? No, I see it really evolving into something that, um, you know, it's sort of uh, we want to empower the world where the idea kind of came from. We actually had a concept of using it for uh, restaurants um, gatherings initially. Um, but then, you know, the pandemic that, that didn't really make a lot of sense anymore. But, you know, I was just walking my dog one day and I I just realized how much time I spent sort of coordinating meetings and everything. And I'm, I'm walking my dog at, you know, I don't if I wait too long, I wait till I get home. I'm not, you know, they might, the calendars might be booked up, but so I wanted something where I could be walking my dog and with one hand on my phone, send a quick email, do, do nothing else and have that meeting fully orchestrated. And, and we built it. No, oh, that's great. And so having them, so we get the meeting orchestrated. When's it going to evolve into this intelligent assistant that's more that, communicates with you right yes yeah, so in addition to just coordination of the appointment um, there's a lot of other things that businesses need so uh, one example is a windshield repair so uh, before the pandemic you know it was like ordering a pizza you would just call one of the companies that show up with a windshield put it on now with labor shortages and supply chain issues you know they might be one or two weeks out so they need coordination and so in addition to, you know, what time you can set that appointment up, you want to know what kind of car you have, what kind of damage it is. So through a conversational experience, we can interview the client and orchestrate that meeting without any phone calls, without, you know, a lot of back and forth. And so, you know, appointments are sort of the, the mission here, but there's a lot more around that, that a, a business can use to have a 24, you know, almost like it's a 24 seven assistant that captures the relevant information related to the appointment. So that's, so we're, you know, we're just super excited. And, um, you know, we, we, you look at a lot of data on Gen Z and younger millennials and they, they, they don't like phones. You know, they're yeah. about 79% of them are kind of anxious about picking up the phone. About 81% are, uh, you know, you know I don't understand it, Sanjay. It's almost like we've lost this humanity. You know what I mean? I don't know about you, but it's like very odd, actually. You're right about it. You know, my daughter, you know, I, right. she's like, she texts me and rather than picking the phone up, it's kind of like weird. You know, I want to like, just say, how you doing? What's going on? You know, you know, the first time I, I sort of, this occurred to me, it was with a, a friend and he, you know, I was, you know, like it wasn't getting a response. And he was, um, he told me that with, with his own wife, if he calls her, she doesn't pick up, but if he Instagrams her, that she would she respond right away because she's on that app already. So I just realized that was that was a few years ago. I realized that was a trend, and now where I think things are going, uh, SpaceX and T-Mobile just announced a partnership where they're putting T-Mobile mid-range antennas um, on V2 SpaceX satellites, um, which will be launched ideally via the Starship. So the idea here is anywhere on the planet, on top of the tallest mountain in the middle of the ocean, you'll be able to have your normal phone you already have for free if you're a T-Mobile subscriber and potentially roaming and other, other providers, but you'll be able to rely on being able to access that satellite. But here's the thing, it's only available for messages. So SMS, but also messaging apps like Slack and, and you know, Runday will be able to do, you know, you'll be, you'll be able to rely on coordinating with businesses through messages where web or data or voice may or may not be available. So that just sets a, a new perspective on the power. And then, you know, kind of what I want to talk about today is the other side of that are these new AI models called transformers. And what they're capable of is something, you know, we've been working in the AI field for about 50 years. And then Elon Musk, uh, you know, put a billion dollars in the, founding open AI, and they just kind of made this commercially viable all of a sudden. Um, so any kind of um, experiences you might have with chatbots or, you know, that are from last year there, it's almost like the Blackberry versus iPhone. Once you have that iPhone, um, that, that Blackberry experience doesn't, you know, isn't something you're going to want anymore. And so we really have, you know, satellite technology that lets you message anywhere on the planet. And then transformer models that can power AI assistants and agents like, you know, like Runday that you can really do business with your top of a mountain and you want to, you know, schedule your windshield repair. Um, 
that type of reality and future is becoming possible in the near term. Wow, that's amazing. So how do you think society is going to change, Sanjay? It's going gonna, it's gonna to transform every, just like the iPhone did or the web browser did before or the microprocessor did. Um, you know, within, I, I think, five or 10 years, every business will have to, um, not just have to, but have the opportunity of embracing. So just imagine use cases like you're at a restaurant and you're ready to pay instead of, you know, and, you, and you're in a hurry. Imagine just texting the restaurant, you know, 20% tip. And you click approve on the price and you, you just leave. So any kind of experience where you have to wait for a person to have a conversation with is going to get automated in a way we've we've never imagined before. And I think until about a year ago, people were, you know, really had no idea how, how close this was. But now, you know, we have uh, we have these platforms that allow us to do this. Now, so Sanji, I got a question going back on the pr- what drives you? You've been, uh, you know, hustlers, you've been real successful, right? What drives you? I think just exploring, you know, I think um, just uh, meeting a lot of people, like kind of bopping around you know, before pandemic. I think I was in five different cities in the, in the two months, um, including, you know, other countries. But I think just, you know, I kind of like bop around the planet and uh, see things. And I'm like, wow, this could be better. or This could be applied here. And then, uh, you know, sometimes there's, uh, you know, the, the, sometimes the world's ready for those ideas, um, you know, and I've, I've been lucky and ha- I've had a few opportunities like that. So, but you've been in five, which cities were you in? Uh, so before, before I, think I was in, in, in India, uh, India, London, Houston, Atlanta, New York. Um, and now, you know, I, I have my puppy. I'm more of a puppy papa. So I stay here. Uh, I'm getting a camper van for us so we can roam around. Um, oh, that's and, great. That's now. now yeah. And so, so what city did you like the best? Um, of all the ones I've been, I think what's, um, what's I mean, I, lo- I love, you know, Caribbean weather. So I love um, going to, I mean, here in Florida and then the Caribbean, I love kind of just enjoying the ocean and I free dive. Um, but I think what's probably changed me most was Japan, um, living in Kyoto. Um, just the way they think about health and wealth and, um, you know, and you look at their economy one way and it, it's, kind of dismal but people are just you know retiring when they have grandkids and just you know people are in okinawa or you know still working at you know there's bicycle messengers that are over 100 years old and people just think about aging and bicycle yes yeah, so, yeah so okinawa japan has the highest density of centarians in the world so there's um and they don't believe in retirement they have a, a diet that's based on slow carbs like sweet potatoes And they think those are some of the secrets to aging, but they have, you know, people don't retire. They just slow down. And there's, there's people over a hundred that are, you know, delivering packages on bicycles and doing all that. sounds great. Was it interesting? Yeah, it was. It was really a very different um, perspective versus, um, you know, work hard and retire early when you're too old to enjoy it sometimes that, that we, I think we have here. So how did it change you? Um, I just kind of in some different ways. One, the way they use space and the way they think about time and aging. Um, you know, it's just sort of like the way I've chosen to uh, have, um, you know, diff- different properties and, you know, like kind of um, in the, I guess the, uh, the van will be the new home, but just having like, you know, kind of modest homes and more of them and just having that variety, that dopamine. Well, like that. Modest home. Yeah. So, so I could put, now tell me a little bit about it. How big is this camper going to be? How big are you going to get it? What is it? It's not that big, actually. It's, um, it has two bedrooms, but one of the bedrooms is a a pop top on the roof. Um, it's 20 feet, so it can literally park in any legal parking spot, like a car. Um, but you can have, you know, kind of a, a Murphy bed in, on the inside. And then there's a pop top, kind of a smaller bed on the roof. So I can have my parents in it and I can, you know, kind of. And it, well, they'll probably be on the Murphy bed, and then I'll I can. Go to wow! But it, and so so um, and who makes those anyhow? Because I was actually looking at those myself. So who this makes one's those? a Winnebago, this one's a Winnebago uh, fifty nine PX Solus. Huh? And it has beds inside, and so you don't have to worry about. I was always concerned because you see these big, uh, you know, these big. Um, bluebirds basically that are people driving around it's like taking an apartment with you and it seems like it would be a pain to drive them but this doesn't sound 20 feet is not a pain to drive 
yeah, this is this is the new I think Gen Z dream in a lot of ways. Like you, I don't remember the Chris Farley on SNL, the van down by the river, and that was sort of the yeah. cautionary tale. Now it's I the remember that the van down by the river. <laughs> wow, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I remember him jumping on the table. <laughs> now that's now that's the dream, just to have a van and have you know solar panels and satellite internet and be able to you know kind of go anywhere and bring your dog. And so, are you going to travel the whole U.S. with this? Uh, you know, I'm not sure yet. We're uh, hopefully getting it next week. So um, I'll, uh, I'll, I think the point of it is uh, you don't have to make a decision or commit to anything. You just, you know, you have everything you need. You got your van down by the river. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> wow, that's great. That sounds like fun. It sounds like you're going to do some exploring. Yeah. So, you know, you've gone through a lot. You're, you know, how did you get in yoga? How did you get into this soul to, to the level that you're at? How did you get into it? Uh, you know, originally it was, um, I was, uh, you know, it was kind of 08. I was sort of, um, you know, it was a tough time in business and I was working a lot. My, uh, my fingers weren't working very well. So I had carpal tunnel pretty bad at braces and, uh, actually Deepak Chopra came to Atlanta to Stone Mountain and he did a retreat. My girlfriend at the time kind of made me go. Um, and, um, I just started getting in the meditation and, you know, we, we went from like kind of nothing to be able to do like three, four hour meditations in front of stone mountain and um just sort of signed up for uh for that and then later kind of got more into uh i teach acro yoga so it's kind of like acrobatic partner yoga we have a base and a flyer and um you know you have a base and a flyer yeah so you you have a base who's kind of on the ground and their feet are up in the air and then you have a flyer on top and then you do, do different acrobatic kind of things you just take them you Take your feet and throw them up in the air, and they twirl, twirl and stuff. Do you do that? Yeah, or? we call them washing machines. There's different like rotations. Oh God, that's amazing. Yeah, and that's some of the more advanced stuff. But there's more basic things that are more based on Thai massage, where it's more just you know stretches. But um, I do it, you know, generally a couple times a week, and um, you know, sort of uh, my my exercise. So it's great, and we have a great little community here on Las Olas in Florida. Wow, that's great. So you do that. So how did it help with your carpal tunnel? Uh, it helped with the carpal tunnel. Um, and then, th I mean, that was more just kind of the yoga and meditation. And then, um, you know, I was, uh, years later, I was having uh, back pain. And there was this book by a Dr. John Sarnos that Wayne Dyer used to talk about called Healing Back Pain. And one of the things it said was like anything you're, uh, you're afraid to do, like go in gently, go in very carefully, but don't avoid it. And so, you know, I was like, well, there's no way I can do acro yoga, right? So, um, so I got into it. And um, could, then I, you know, became uh, kind of became a teacher. Wow, that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. So, you know, what are your dreams? What are you looking at over the next five years? What are your own dreams? What do you want to do? You know, I'm just kind of having more more places to stay. The van is the next one that's coming up and just being able to like, you know, just kind of park it on the beach and, and have that lifestyle and kind of travel between uh, different things easily. And then, you know, I think just kind of really building a platform that um, that's, you know, potentially used by a billion people. Just I see how um, how difficult it is for people, especially after pandemic, to kind of reconnect and uh, and get together and, and and manage with all the chaos. But just sort of like creating a world where the AI can be this very benign facilitator. Not necessarily you're talking to the AI, but you're using the AI to help you talk to people and coordinate your time and just uh, you know be be a lot more efficient. You know, I'm excited about just sort of a lot of the environmental changes, uh, solar panels. I want to build a, a kind of a tiny house village eventually that's, that's, um, solar powered. Um, you know, have my, my parents there when they're ready to retire, things like that. But uh, I think the world's just moving in, uh, you know, we're, we have some challenging transitions ahead of us, but the, the world's really moving in a very positive direction overall. No, I like it. I like to, <laughs> well, it sounds like you're becoming more bohemian, you know what I mean? <laughs> Jump around and that's great. So the, tell us a little bit more about, so if you go through run day, what's going to happen? I mean, you look at these kind of advanced models of artificial intelligence, how smart are they going to get? I mean, they're already superhuman. Um, if you, so kind of going back into history a little bit. So I, I call it artificial imagination and sometimes artificial intuition because AI meaning artificial intelligence, that, that tends to be overused as a marketing term and everyone's just slapping it on their, their products. So, you know, where the distinction is, the first moment was something called Move 37. So um, if you go back further, actually, so when Kasparov 
um, was playing chess back in the 90s, they said, okay, well, you beat someone at chess, but that's really a brute force system. You can calc- If you can calculate every chess move, you can win. You'll never, you know, a machine will never beat a human at something like Go. So that was a challenge that AlphaGo kind of took on. And so they, um, they created an AI that was able to beat the best human team at Go. And the way it works wasn't a brute, brute force approach. Instead, it uses kind of imagination or intuition. And the first example of that is called Move 37. There was a game where the AI was trained on, you know, a lot of um, existing human games and moves that had been done. But it did something that no one had ever done before and no one ever thought perhaps you should do. So it strategically created a move that was, you know, just out of the box and out of nowhere. And and it and it did beat, you know, I believe it did beat the uh, that match. But it was the first example of artificial intuition where the machine sort of uh, came up with something that there was no evidence that it was based on. There were no rules, no programming, no code. And since then, you're, you know, that has sort of become, you know, what I'll call modern AI. And you also see it in examples like um, you look at 8K TVs. It, it's almost impossible to create 8K media and stream it on the networks we have. But we have 8K TVs that are beautiful. And what they do is just like an artist would. It takes a low, you know, so the way these models are trained, you give it a, a 8K signal. And then you give it a very degraded version of that. That's say you know 480p, and you train it to predict the 8K signal based on the very low quality signal. And there's no way you know algorithmically to do this properly. But if you allow it to be creative and fill in the gaps the way an artist would, you can now power through imagination an 8K display with enough pixels that look really good. Um, then this works from everything from like say clouds or just, or just, you know, text and fonts and making them really crisp by using its imagination, it fills in these pixels in a way, but you know, this is, this is being applied, I think ever. So that's really kind of what a transformer model does. So the most, um, is that the synthetic data? Yeah. It's not so much synthetic data. It's actually using real data. So it's trained on things like Wikipedia or GitHub um, or visual information. So uh, a good example is something like Dolly, where you can describe a picture of something that doesn't exist, and it will literally draw it for you. And there's um, there's a lot of artistic sort of ramifications to this. We, you know, we didn't really know what intelligence was, and we're starting to get a glimmer of it as we build these things. There's a famous saying like, "I don't understand something I can't build." Now that we can build these sort of creative experiences, we're starting to understand what consciousness, intelligence is a little bit further um you know we're, we're still very far from what we'll call agi or or you know kind of artificial generalized intelligence where it can literally do anything a human can but for specific cases um we're we're achieving superhuman levels so dolly for example it's you know it's not actually better than any artist but it does it in seconds so it literally creates wow. a a master's level painting and then you know so well, who are that painting though sanjay if it's done well, who's the owner then? Let's say, you know, where does this go on? That's a great question. It's not clear who owns it. So it's not using any an existing IP. So it's been trained on famous artwork. However, if you say make me something in the Picasso style, it's not actually storing any Picassos in its memory. So it's really, you know, call it artificial inspiration in that way. Yeah, so well, it, I like that artificial inspiration. <laughs> So it, it can, you know, can help everyone be an artist. So instead of looking for an image, like in software, we're always looking for pictures on on Google and, and various sites. But now it's like you could almost describe something and have it create that image from scratch. Well, you like that. I'm going to have to write an article about artificial inspiration. I think that's, yeah. really, that's a great so term. It's, so it's going to, yeah, no, it's going to change every business. I mean, it, once you are able to very quickly create images or... Um, where, where the more near-term, you know, business opportunity is, what we're doing at Renday is really text. So mm-hmm. someone is, you know, texting a business. Um, you know, I bought a uh, umbrella policy the other day. It took took almost a month. It took multiple phone calls, probably three hours on the phone. And it's really something that we think that a conversational AI can handle to say, hey, here's your policies. You also need an umbrella. You're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to elevate your auto policy to a certain level to make this work. Is that okay? 
but really something that is a very frustrating buying process could be done over, you know, in, in minutes over text messages. And we think that's the, the near term opportunity. No, it sounds like everywhere. I mean, with this, it streamlines the system. It optimizes it, streamlines it, and it becomes more hyper personalized for you. And every day, it gets, it's going to get better and better. And, and then it'll start it's, recommending it's, things for you, right? It'll get to a point where it starts recommending based and on knowing what you like and what you need and what you should have, right? Yeah, that, that's something we're we're thinking about. In terms you of, may want, right? Yeah, so that it's, we're thinking about that in terms of you know dinner reservations. So imagine being able to say there's five people, they all have busy schedules, figure out not not only when there's availability, but but based on uh, potentially allergens or food preferences, imagining what people the group might want, and then going to go see if that's that's available on something like Open Table in terms of a reservation. No, I love that. That well, that's cool stuff. Listen, we're coming to the top of the show. Closing thoughts and how do people get a hold of you, Sanjay? I'm um, just uh, it's Sanjay at runday.ai. Um, it's like run day, like Sunday, but with an R, um, dot AI. Um, and yeah, looking forward to uh, kind of working with different businesses and partnerships to bring conversational AI to their their business process and really delight customers with um, an experience that the next generation has really grown up on and is very, uh, very attuned to. No, it's great. Sanjay, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join me here for the show today. And to the audience out there, you know, we talk about InfoBCD, having tools like Runday to be able to solve these challenges in front of us and make our lives easier and better and more efficient are going to be critically important to our future. My name is Gary Fowler. I'm the CEO, President, and Co-Founder of GSD Get You Done Venture Studios. It was great having you here today. Stay happy, stay safe, and stay healthy. And Sanjay, thanks for joining us. Stay tuned, everybody. We'll be back again next week for our exciting edition of GSD Presents. Thank you. Thank you.